signed into law in the fall and went into effect on March 1st. Um, and so we have some more guidelines, some a little bit more definitive uh, things that we can look at when determining what an alimony order should be, as well as the duration and time frame that, that, that alimony is going to last for. You know, and kind of the only context where we would expect, you know, this alimony issue to come into effect or to potentially be, you know, involve you is, again, if you're, if you're providing your children with regular gifts, if we're looking at those more as income as opposed to, you know, just funds that they get occasionally. Because um, if I see that it, it's coming in as income, it can be used for the purposes of calculation of alimony for your child, um, which is also similar to when we're looking at you know, child support. Child support, we have a, a formula that we have to use, um, and again, it's based on gross incomes of the parties. So if we see that there's a, an annual history of gifts or funds being provided, if there's a trust that a child is getting monthly distributions from, certainly we can include that in when we're calculating, or at least make the argument that that should be included in the calculation for the purposes of child support. So, this brings up all kinds of questions, doesn't it? <laughs> it kind of makes you think about this stuff. So, if, 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 you're, if, you're a, a, if you're Frank and Mary now, and you're trying to deal with this issue, right, uh, of this possible, this $400,000 that may be going to the kids, and you're trying to think about how to plan around that, Go, going back to our, th to our earlier three questions, what, you know, we, we, can we talk about what the impact would be in, in, in terms of if they if if the uh, if the divorce occurred before the parents died because there just have to be a report that these assets were going to be given out. Suppose that the parents died and left four hundred thousand dollars in this case to to Peter in this situation. Suppose first of all, suppose they just left it to him straight four hundred thousand dollars. So there isn't an income stream. There's just cash going to him. How does that get considered by the court? And based on your experience, given this situation, what? what would you anticipate the impact would be? You know, first of all, would you assume that in the absence of that money and in the absence of some other factor, things would have been divided 50-50? I think, I think, you know, everything's taken on a case-by-case -case basis, but in general terms... Ah, uh, lawyers always say. <laughs> in, general, in general terms, yeah. you know, I can give you some, some ideas of timing-wise and how it would affect a potential award, a divorce. You know, in case one, where um, they're divorced uh, before the clients pass away. Again, that's kind of the future expectation that we're looking at. It's not something that's going to be divisible by the court, but it's certainly something the court can take into consideration. So that if we're looking at the marital estate um, and husband has a chance of getting, let's say, $1 million um, in a future inheritance, the court might say, you know what, a 50-50 division of marital assets is not necessarily equitable and reasonable given that the husband has this opportunity, a pretty substantial opportunity, of receiving you know, a, a large amount of income in an inheritance. Um, and so the court might try to look at how to divide the marital estate, might give a little bit more to the wife in that case. Um, if we're looking and, and, and so if, 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 the, if, the, if, if Peter was just get, getting a pile of money as opposed to an income stream, would the issue totally be about the division of the assets, or would it also have an effect on what could be the alimony award going from Peter to his wife? At the time of the divorce, again, if we're looking at a future in, uh, inheritance, I can't make an argument that that should be considered for the purposes of alimony and child support. It wouldn't be until he actually received those incomes where you would have the potential of going in on a modification and saying, look, his income stream has increased substantially. It's time to modify the alimony order or the child support order because he now has $400,000 in cash that he's going to be using as income. So from Peter's perspective in the divorce, is there something that he could be doing uh, if Frank and Mary are still alive, to keep the modification from showing up in the future? Is there some way that, he can't, that the deal can be with the wife, that this issue can't be brought up in the future, or is that always open? Um, in alimony, we can, get a, we can get what's called a full waiver so that it, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult for someone to be able to come back in down the road for alimony. Child support, you can never negotiate your right away to deal with financial issues in child support because the court feels you can't negotiate away your children's ability to be financially secure. So we can certainly put some provisions in an agreement or a, you know, in a judgment that would allow that, that alimony would not be dealt with in the future, but we can't do that with child support. Okay. 
So now let's go to, to, to number two. So Frank and Mary have died, and the wife's just been waiting for this moment, you know, and now she decides to file for her divorce because all of a sudden, uh, you know, Peter just picked up another $400,000. In that situation, once again, because you, know, you saw Peter's other financial situation, he had equity in the house of about 150. He had a fairly small IRA. That was, that was, those were his assets, right? So suddenly the extra 400000 in terms of his kind of the, the equation is a huge amount of money, right? So can you give us a sense if it were fairly quick, short after the, 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 the deaths that, that the inheritance was received, what would be the impact on the asset split? Given the fact that it's case by case, what, would, you know, what is your sense of what the impact would be and what could be the impact on the alimony, on, on any alimony awards? I think in general, I think of it, the divorce happens six months after the client, clients die. I, we'd have to know again, is it, would it, had it been considered as a future right you know, during the underlying divorce? Um, if, if no one had an idea, if there had been no, no, no excuse me, in this situation, they're not, they hadn't been divorced yet. The wife waited. So okay. now, now, that, now, we're, now they're in for the divorce for, their, for the right. first time after six months out. Okay, so in that case, we could, we could argue potentially that the inheritance should not be considered as part of the division of the actual marital estate. We could say that it's been left to Peter and it needs to stay in his column. Uh, typically, we can do that if, you know, again, there has been no gifts, you know, kind of during the underlying marriage. And also, if the children had not been kind of spending in anticipation of this inheritance, we can say that that needs to stay over in Peter's column. It shouldn't be subject to division for parts of the marital estate. Um, but of course, certainly if there's an income stream from that inheritance, then potentially we're looking at, at using those for our alimony or our child support numbers. Um, so again, it would kind of stay on Peter's side of the column, but we'd still need to look at making sure that the, the underlying marital estate was pretty much equalized so that we had an equitable division. Uh, but probably in, in this case, in scenario two, you know, Peter would be able to kind of keep that inheritance to himself. So, so, so the, you're saying the likelihood is, because once again, it varies case by case because it always also varies judge by judge. There's a lot of discretion in these cases, right? So, so the likelihood is that the, that the split of assets wouldn't be affected. But you're saying that given the fact that he's now got $400,000, the court may impute some income from that and say, well, if you get $400,000, then you're going to have an income stream of, you know, 5% of $400,000 or of something, and therefore that might affect the alimony award? It could. Again, it depends how it's set up. If, if he's able to get a stream of income, if it's set up in a trust where he's getting disbursements on a monthly basis, we would argue that those disbursements themselves are income which should be, which should be considered for the purposes of alimony and child support. You know, if it's a trust and it's very difficult for him to get at those funds, you know, the harder it is for him to use those funds as income, you know, the harder it's going to be for me to make the argument that it should be considered income uh, for him. Again, if he has a, a large inheritance that he's received, it's not a stream of income, but it's an asset, then we're looking at it more as a division in the marital estate than we are as, as anything for the purposes of child support and alimony. What a great segue. You said the magic word trust. So if the, if the parents were looking, if the parents saw, didn't especially like the daughter-in-law anyway, and were looking to kind of deal with this, could they try to structure their assets so that instead of Peter just getting the money, the money were in trust for Peter, maybe naming Paul or Mary Jr. as a trustee, maybe limiting their, even the trustee's ability to give Peter anything for some period of time, or, or naming the grandchildren as beneficiaries. What about that? Right. So, right. you know, I think, again, the harder it is for Peter to actually get at those funds, the harder it's going to be for me to make an argument that it should be considered as income. Um, if we have trustees and Peter can't, you know, isn't getting monthly disbursements, if he can't invade principal, um, it's going to make it difficult for me. If, in fact, it's left to the, the, the grandchildren, uh, you know, the court does not like to really, you know, use those. Can it be considered part of the marital estate to a certain extent? But, you know, if it's left for the grandchildren, you know, again, it makes it that much harder for me to say that it should be considered between the parties, you know, especially for the purposes of income, but also as part of that kind of marital estate. Now talk about, about number three. So, so, so Peter got the money, he left it in a separate account just in his name, you know, but they occasionally used it, right? They, got, they, they may have withdrawn some money, they may have used the income from the money during the next five years, and then they get divorced. So does that change the way in which the court looks at whether that 500000 is in play? I think it does. I think especially if they're, if they're utilizing it on a regular basis, if it's kind of a general fund, if it's kind of been woven into the marriage and been used for, you know, marital assets, whether it be that and they... And who would, right? I mean, you've got 400000 sitting around, yeah, right? You really want to go to that. Disney World, right. you know? Right. 
Right. I think, you know, if he, if he had the money and kind of put it to the side, <laughs> and maybe they used it occasionally in the last five years just for special occasions, maybe the argument would be that, you know, that still needs to stay on his side of the column. Again, the more it's kind of become woven into the marriage, you know, if they use it to pay the mortgage one month, you know, some bills the next month, you know, then we're saying that that's part of the marital estate and that should be divided. Um, so again, the more usage you get out of it, uh, the more likely it is that it's going to be brought into the underlying divorce. Jennifer, thank you very much. You. And once again, she'll be taking questions at the end. So I bet you just learned some new things <laughs> about some of these possibilities. So that's Peter's situation. Once again, the moral of the story is if, you're, if, you are, if you've got this kind of concern, you've got to tell your lawyer about this. Because you know, sometimes this, is, this doesn't come up. You know, because I'll be meeting with clients and, you know, they don't want to tell me that Peter's got a problem, right? Which is okay, but they're not doing Peter any favor by doing that, right? Because if Peter ha does have a potential problem, maybe we can be structuring some things, and I think we were just talking about some ways to do that, to deal with it. And one of the hard parts about doing that kind of planning is as opposed to what the work that I do a lot of, which is dealing with mass health, where the rules are the rules and there are published regulations and you can all go read the regulations. It's like the IRS and the, the question is, how do you play with the regulations? In this case, as Jennifer said, this varies from, 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 from court to court, from case to case. I know you've heard me do the, the kind of line that from, from the t-shirt that my daughter once gave me, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. The, the question is, who are you in front of? You know, what day are you in front of? That's actually one of the reasons why you really want to have a divorce lawyer you know, if you're Peter, that kind of knows who all the judges are. Just not, not, that, not, that, not that anyone's going to do any favors, but just so that you have a sense of how people look at these questions since they're not set in stone. So, Paul. Uh, Paul is also married, and he has twins, Jack and Jill. Next slide. Uh, and they're doing about the same. He's about doing about the same as Peter is. He's got a house with the equity of $150,000. they have got joint savings. He has a 401k of 100, she has one of 50. And look, they earn the same amounts, Peter and Peter's, or Paul and his wife, as Peter and his wife did. So they're in very similar financial situation. They're very, very happily married. There is no, that, that is not a concern. Uh, Jack and Jill, though, are, se are seniors in high school. And uh, they, are, they are a little bit, and, 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 and they're very, and the grandparents are very excited. Frank and Mary are very excited because they've been applying to college. And Jack got into Worcester State, which is exactly where he wanted to go. And Jill got into Harvard, which is exactly where she wanted to go, right? But now the question is, how do you pay for Worcester State and Harvard? Um, and, the, and the question is, if Frank and Mary die and leave their $400,000 to Paul, uh, what effect, if any, does that have on the financial aid that Jack, that Jack could get at Worcester State and that Jill could get at Harvard, right? And, and I'm just going to kind of anticipate one question. If instead, if instead, the, the, the Frank and Mary had said, oh, you know, what, you know we're, what we're really interested in is we want to make sure that our grandkids get their college education. So, and, you know, and, and we know that the parents are going to have to, you know, spend the money anyway. So instead of leaving the money just to, to Paul, we're going to leave the money to Jack and Jill or entrust for Jack and Jill to pay for their college education, right? What effect does that have? Uh, um, Sharon McLaughlin is here, um, and this is what she does for a living, is she deals with parents who are trying to figure out what kind of financial aid, um, first of all, how the kids get into college, and then what kind of financial aid their kids could get. So I wanted her to come to, to talk to you about how the college figures it out. Um, because once again, this is not something you can go online and read the regulations, because the regulations don't exist, but you want to try to understand how the college thinks this out, and I asked her specifically to look at Jack's problem and Jill's problem and tell you what the impacts would be. Sharon. 